Hello, this is the Exploring Software Bills of Material team. I'm Olivia. I'm Judy. I'm Alice. I'm Caleb. I'm James. And I'm Raul. We're excited to share with you all our project for today. We'll take questions at the end, or if any questions pop up during the presentation, feel free to type them up in the Zoom chat and we'll address them at the end. Alice will start us off. Thanks, Ollie. So in addition to the six of us, we also have our mentors at the Duke CoLab, the Duke IT Security Office, the Duke Planisphere, and our sponsors at Cisco. Over the span of the past five years, two high profile cyber attacks have taken the tech industry by surprise. The first was the SolarWinds cyber attack in March of 2020, which was a supply chain attack that occurred when SolarWinds sent out software updates to its customers that included hacked code. The code created a backdoor to customers' IT systems, which hackers then used to install even more malware that helped them spy on companies and organizations, causing irreparable damage worth billions of dollars. This exposed at least 18,000 computer networks to malicious code and also jeopardized national security, leading to US sanctions against dozens of Russian intelligence officials in 2021. The other major attack was the Log4j, which was a software vulnerability in a popular Java library which enabled a remote attacker to take control of a device on the internet if the device is running certain versions of Log4j. Duke was also impacted by this, with Duke Hub being down for a few days with student data at risk of being compromised in December of 2021. Due to the high profile nature and scale of these cyber attacks, there has been a push on the federal level for software developers to be more transparent. Details of what code is contained in a software referred to as software bills of materials, have become one of the most widely discussed potential defense options today. You might be wondering, what are SBOMs? Great question. In modern times, our software is often made from many different parts, called dependencies, most of which are obtained from open source code. These parts are often made up of many different parts, which are made up of many more different parts, and so on and so forth. SBOMs, otherwise known as software bills of materials, keep track of all of these parts and where they came from and can be used to easily track vulnerability throughout the dependencies. I'll pass it off to Judy to give us a little more background knowledge about the field. The good thing is that open source technology already exists to create SBOMs in many different formats. Two of the most popular formats are SPDX and Cyclone DX. We chose Cyclone DX format, which is adopted by companies like Google and GitLab, over SPDX, which is more detailed but also more complicated. So the good thing is that we can already make SBOMs. The problem is that SBOMs contain way too much information to manually parse and make sense of. These files contain a lot of technical jargon and are easily hundreds of thousands of lines of text. With that in mind, let us introduce CHIP. Our web-based application, the Centralized Hub for Inventories Platform, or CHIP for short, allows for simplified SBOM creation, visualization, and use. Our website, CHIP, should 1. Store SBOMs efficiently and easily, 2. Display vulnerabilities and other information for each SBOM, and 3. More of a stretch goal, visualize the dependency trees that shows how components are related for each SBOM. And with this, Alice will introduce our tech stack and how we're building our project. To give a high-level overview of our project, we're about building the front end with React, the back end with Ruby on Rails. We're using MySQL for the database, and we're deploying our web application with Docker, passing it off to Raul to introduce the database. The database is one of the most important pieces in our project, since it stores all the information from an SBOM. For a database, we're using MySQL, since it is a purely relational type database, and the SBOMs have a defined structure, which is a cycle in DX format. As a result, it allows us to store the information in a more efficient and organized way using different data tables. Epsilons can be JSON files. Epsilons can be JSON files thousands of lines long. And sometimes there is information that is not important. As a result, we had to research more about the tools that generate an SBOM, how, how the SBOM is files is structured, and what information is most useful. We were able to create our first schema that consisted only of S1 components and metadata. For the second version of the database, we added vulnerabilities and dependencies. The final version of our database includes data tables such as metadata, tools, and S1 components that allow us to keep an inventory of, the, of software. It also includes other data tables such as vulnerabilities, which tracks any piece of software within the main software 
that might be vulnerable. And dependencies, which is a key piece of permission to visualize relationships between all the transitive dependencies. Furthermore, it is important to mention that S1 components and vulnerabilities each have a unique global ID. When storing a new S1, we're using this ID to identify if one of, of these S1 components or vulnerabilities already exists in our database. If so, instead of redundantly creating a new S1 component or vulnerability, we will link them directly to the S1. Now, Kev is going to talk more about the Ruby on Rails part of the backend. Now, we're going to talk more about some necessary features that our application has in the backend. One of them is routes. In order to provide our users with a versatile and, and intuitive interface to interact with the application, we have defined a comprehensive RESTful API with multiple endpoints. Our routes enable users to add SBOM files to the database, update them, and they can as well delete the specific SBOM files. Now we're going to talk more about some additional features that our application has. One of them is built-in uh, vulnerability updates, authentication, and SBOM generation. Uh, the scheduler. The scheduler in this case is the built-in vulnerability updates. Our database stores information about different vulner vulnerabilities. However, the severity of uh, these vulnerabilities can change over time due to various factors. So we needed a way to regularly update the severity ratings in our database to reflect the most recent information. To ensure we have the most updated information, we utilize Google's open source vulner vulnerability database. The OSV provides a comprehensive comprehensive and updated database that we can rely on to get the most recent data on various vulnerabilities. With this, we implemented a 24-hour periodic vulnerability update check on our application. Uh, authentication. Authentication is a crucial component in the security landscape, especially with, with software builds of materials currently playing a significant role in the industry. Ensuring restricted and secure access to these resources is thus of paramount importance. To achieve this, we integrated Shibboleth with the application for a single sign-on solution. Now, Raul will talk more about SBOM generation. In order to make it easier for developers to generate an SBOM, we created four different SBOM generator scripts for Mac, Linux, Windows, and Docker. The scripts use three different tools to generate a single JSON SBOM file in what we call the, the chip SBOM format. From there, the user just needs to upload the script move it to a location of the project and run the script. First, the metadata dependencies are generated using the CDXGen tool. Then, the resulting JSON file is piped through Gripe to generate S1 components and vulnerabilities. Finally, the two JSON files are merged into a final S1 file using the JQ library. Although the output JSON files from CDXGen and Gripe aren't recycled in the X format, when we merge both files, we're producing a new type of format that recompiles the most useful information from both outputs and combines them. To make it even easier for developers, we build and push into Docker Hub our own Docker image that generates the, the same S1, but without the necessity of downloading anything. The only requirement is to have Docker installed and by running a single command, the user will be able to, to have an S1 in little over a minute. I'll hand it to Judy to talk more about the front end. Finally, we will move to our front end, which we built using the React library for JavaScript. We started out by using Figma to create a wireframe for our website. This specific example is the view SBOMs page, which displays all the SBOMs a user has uploaded and additionally gives associated information for each SBOM. We had ideas in this page that we weren't able to fully implement, such as different colors for different levels of vulnerability risk, but overall, the Figma pages were very useful for keeping our front end consistent and easy to plan out. Next, Alice will introduce how we're building our dependency trees, a unique feature to our application that displays how components of an SBOM are related. We've been working hard to make it easy for our clients to understand the tons of information that comes out of an SBOM by creating a tree visual visualization for the SBOM. We first wrote an algorithm that traverses the SBOM recursively, identifying all of the dependencies and vulnerabilities. Then we used the React D3 tree library to turn this information into a visual tree. Each node on the, on the tree is a package, and the lines between them show which packages depend on which. If there's a problem with a package, we highlight it in red so it's easy to spot. This way, users can not only see which package has a problem, but also which other packages might be affected by it is a simple visual way to understand complex information, making it easier for our clients to make informed decisions. Next, James will give us a walkthrough of the app. 
Thank you, Alice. At this point in time, we have successfully created a minimal viable product for our application. Let's take a look at the demo. All right, here on the home page, you'll see a navigation bar on the left-hand side and a main page on the right side. Shout out to Code Plus and Duke OIT and Cisco for making this project possible. If we scroll down, you'll see some details regarding the background of our project for our users to read. Let's go ahead and log in over here on the left. The application redirects us to Shibboleth Authentication and you can see the users logged in because you can see the name and the NetID on the left-hand side. Let's head over to View Esmond's page and take a look. Here, we can find all the tools for interpreting SBOMs. On the top left-hand corner, you can see a spot to upload an SBOM after giving it a name and a description. The main part of the page includes details of several SBOMs that I have already uploaded for this demo. Once we search for a specific SBOM, we can open it up to see more details. When you open up the accordion, you can see more details such as the metadata, uh, such as the timestamp and the tools used. Let's go over to the viewing the visualization tree for this particular SBOM. After reading this disclaimer of which software packages our application is most, most compatible with, we we're able to see that there is a beautiful dependency, dependency tree that breaks down the application for the user to view. It's animated and interactive with the user's mouse input, and it loads in dependencies that the user is interested in checking out. This interactivity is really good because no other tools on the market are able to do this. Let's head on back to view some more vulnerability information. For each SBOM, the vulnerabilities are listed out with details such as the name of the vulnerability, the vulnerability ID, a source link, a severity ranking, a list of affected packages, and a link for further action. This page is designed to be dynamic and it's automatically updated for different SBOMs that have different numbers of vulnerabilities. If we head on back, we, let's check on one more great function that we have, which is the change edit name description function. This button allows for us to update data in the database without having to upload the same SBOM file again. Let's head over to generate SBOMs and take a look. Up top, you'll see some information about the tools that we've integrated and used for generating SBOMs for the user to read if they're interested in learning more. Below, you'll find different options to run our application on Linux, Mac, Windows, or Docker. We even have our very own Docker image published for public use. And that's it. Let's go ahead and log out to make sure no one else can access our important information and head back to the home page. I'll now hand it over to Ali for a quick summary of our project. We'll go over a summary of what we've done so far and what we'd like to do in the future. In the back end, we've worked hard on creating our primary database in MySQL, after which we set up our API in Ruby on Rails to both provide and take in data from the front end to either upload, edit, or display information about an SBOM. In the front end, we finished up the pages and added user interactivity with a sleek and simple finish. As for single sign-on, we've set up session cookies to keep the user logged in with Shibboleth, projecting all of our sensitive data, making most of our app functionalities inaccessible to those not signed in. For future expansion upon our project, we have three main ideas in mind. We'd like to finish up the tree visualization and add a filter or search function for certain dependencies or vulnerabilities. As of current, we've implemented a daily check-in on the severity of vulnerabilities in our database, but we would like to take it a step further and implement a periodic, periodic check on the existence of new vulnerabilities using the same OSB database we are currently using. And finally, we'd also like to run a user accessibility check on our app to make the front end as accessible for users as possible. All right, thank you everyone for listening. Before we open the floor for questions, we have a couple of thank yous to hand out. Without the massive amounts of support that we received throughout this 10 week experience, it seriously would not have been possible to have accomplished what we've been able to achieve without all these people. First, a huge shout out to Alexa Sparco and Julie Biani, our wonderful team leads. Your mentorship and patience have helped us learn an immense amount about the world of software engineering, and we can't thank you enough for the summer experience. To Denai Atkinson and everyone who helped us at the Innovation Collab, thank you for your willingness to help us throughout the summer, both inside and outside of office hours. We've learned so much from the way that you tackle the most difficult coding problems head on. 
to Alex Merck and Adam To, our mentors from Security Plus and the team leads of the Honeylots team, thank you for facilitating many creative and intriguing conversations about cybersecurity that was key to our motivation for working on our project this summer. To Echo Chen, Elise Zhang, and Kevin Shen, our project managers, thank you for making the summer filled with fun, and especially thank you for always being there to emotionally support us. Through the ups and the downs, we could always count on you guys to show up with a smile and help us push through each day. To the Duke IT Security Office, our stakeholders, and our clients, thank you for supporting us by showing up, listening to the progress that we've made through the summer, and most importantly, being honest with your comments on our project. Your feedback has helped us ensure that our project is nothing but the best quality it could be. To Jeff Shu and Cisco, our sponsors, thank you for making the time to meet with us multiple times throughout this experience. You've made sure that we tackle this project with purpose and open the door for discussing topics in cybersecurity that are much bigger than just our project. And finally, to Isabel Valls and Jen Visas, our wonderful Code Plus program directors, thank you for always being there for us, both in person and over Microsoft Teams, as well as organizing social events and breakfasts for the entire summer. I can't begin to imagine how much of a logistical nightmare it must be to run this program. And we all want to thank you for the dedication and enthusiasm that you bring to this program every single day. 